Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Glenn Madden. I work with Mark on CSS modules. Uh, in fact, those conversations that he talked about with Tobias Coppers, we were away at a JavaScript uh, event in Australia called CampJS. And so we had this quite useful iteration cycle of while Tobias was asleep, we would talk about stuff, and then Mark would go away and talk to him online when he woke up in Germany. And in three days, we hashed out a big chunk of this, uh, of this project. Um, I'm going to be talking about CSS modules as well, but from kind of a different direction, because I, um, uh, when I got involved in the project, I had my own kind of background, the own, my own ways of doing style. And Mark and I disagreed on a lot of points, and CSS modules is really kind of a compromise of these two points of view that we think now has the resilience to cover a lot of use cases. Um, and I think it's a big benefit to have gone through that process. <clears throat> But what I'm interested in talking about is the change I think it represents in CSS, not necessarily CSS modules being successful, but this shift, this, this progression. Uh, and I'm calling this idea modular style, which I've started to use a little bit. Um, and that's, my talk's going to be about that. The first part of my talk is about the difference between a, uh, something that's designed for humans and something that's constrained by machines. I'm going to go all the way back to the invention of the compiler by Grace Hopper. She wrote in a, in a news, um, uh, magazine article in 1987 that in 1952 she had a running compiler, but nobody would touch it. They thought that computers could only do arithmetic. And really, it, it, it uh, constitutes a breaking point where we were completely constrained by what the machine could do. Before that, all you could give it was machine instructions. You had to translate everything in your head. And this, you know, it's, what is this, 63 years ago was the first time anybody had ever progressed, written something that then the machine would translate to what the machine could run. And I scoot forward a little bit to September 2008, which is a far darker time in history, uh, at least in uh, the history of the web. <laughs> in 2008, uh, Firefox uh, was uh, at version 2, but 75% of the online world used IE, and IE was at version 7. It was, well, basically, if this is humans versus machines, in 2008, the machines were winning. Uh, JavaScript in 2008 had started to mature, though. There was started, some patterns had started to emerge. jQuery had, um, had really started to establish itself. The plugin ecosystem was pretty healthy. And this was sort of the... the uh, best practice in 2008. You would write everything, attach it to window, uh, make sure that you weren't clobbering something that was already there, attach your code somewhere that somebody else could find it and run. Uh, what, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the way this code uh, is written, but it implies the fact that you have a global uh, namespace. You have nothing except what's on window, and the only kind of conceptual method for execution is sequential. If you want two things in the, in the file, simply concatenate them. Also, at the end of 2008, Google came out with Chrome. I don't know if you remember, they released this comic book uh, to try to educate the 75% of people who are using IE that you could choose uh, a browser, and if you could choose, obviously, you wouldn't choose IE. Um, Google Chrome was uh, quickly uh, popular, partly because of the performance of V8, which was its JavaScript interpreter. And it was far faster than the JavaScript interpreters of the day. And that helped to catalyze a movement that had already started around the idea of running JavaScript on the server. This, this, uh, the project at that point was called Server.js. Kevin Dangor wrote in January of, that, of 2009 that for JavaScript to really come of age, and to work on the server, it needed a standard way to include modules. The JavaScript specification, as it was, wasn't sufficient. Uh, it needed those modules to live in discrete namespaces. You could already do namespaces just by attaching things to window in a, in a conventional way, but you couldn't include other people's code just once. He then went on to write that server-side JavaScript is very fragmented, that if you wanted to do anything beyond what JavaScript was designed for, like access a file on the file system, you couldn't do that the same way on the two server-side uh, JavaScript interpreters, Rhino and V8. 
SpiderMonkey and JavaScript Core, they couldn't load the same modules, uh, external modules in the same way. And so every time somebody wanted to use JavaScript for a web framework, they had to create a bunch of APIs that other programmers took for granted. And what I think is interesting is if you replace the year 2009 and you talk about CSS instead of server-side JavaScript, there is this sort of sense of, um, of a lack of legitimacy around the tooling around CSS. And that if you want to write a framework like Bootstrap, it's either very tied to less as it was or SAS as it is now. And that SAS and less and the post-CSS plugin ecosystem do create um, APIs that other programming languages now, including JavaScript, take for granted. OK, so also in 2009, Node.js comes out. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of uh, Node.js, even if you don't use JavaScript day to day. In March, Chris Cole, who was also blogging and influential around this time, wrote that this year had begun with a combination of wondrous events in JavaScript. He'd been struggling to promote the idea of a module system in JavaScript for several years now, and there had been a sudden explosion of progress. And I also feel that that's what's happening with CSS at the moment. There's a lot of energy coming from the React community, a lot of new ideas, maybe some bad ones as well. But the, the, the collective kind of spirit is that CSS is undergoing a change. And there are a lot of uh, smart people working on uh, this hard problem, and that maybe we are stumbling across a solution. So by the middle of 2009, JavaScript had a new name. The server-side JavaScript had a new name, CommonJS. And I'm sure a lot of you will know that term, CommonJS. It's sort of not maybe what you think it is. CommonJS was tried to be a standard that handled all these different ways of handling um, dependencies in JavaScript. Node.js didn't really follow that on, and Node won. Whatever Node does, the thing that Node does, Node.js's module system is what we call CommonJS today. Um, Substack calls it common esque uh, which is a pretty good description of what it is. It's kind of based around these two lines, require and modular exports. And what it did to that language, what it did to JavaScript, is quite profound, because previously you had namespace widget foobar equals function, and now you have to explicitly require everything you need and explicitly export everything you make for something else to require. But what I like about this example and this contrast is that the words window, namespace, widgets, and foobar disappeared from your code because they're implied by the file system. Your file foobar.js lives inside the widget, which lives inside your namespace directory. So of course, that's what it's about. You don't have to write it every time. And that, I think, is a particularly relevant um, to CSS, uh, as what Mark was talking about before. So I know what you must be thinking. I mean, this is CSSConf, not JSConf. This is a great history lesson of JavaScript, but I mean, JavaScript has uh, a lot more power than CSS ever will. We're not going to run CSS on the server or write you know, um, operating systems in it. And that's true, but the change in the ecosystem around JavaScript can happen to CSS. The change in JavaScript was pretty small. The, these lines were valid before. Uh, they just had no meaning. The require and module were whatever you define them to be. But if you wrap a module system around it and you wrap an ecosystem around it, that can fundamentally change how people write JavaScript. And it was successful. NPM came along not long after. Uh, NPM is now extremely popular. There is a module on NPM for literally everything, absolutely everything. And everything that ever will be is already on NPM. Uh, by changing the ecosystem in JavaScript, that revolutionized what, what JavaScript was, what it could be, and what it is today. And I think the key thing was that the human interface went from having to remember that all this other code was going to run before yours and all this code was going to run after yours to having an actual module system. And having no mechanism for sharing code except putting one file in front of the other and including something off a CDN and then your script tag, to having 200,000 packages on NPM. What makes that particularly relevant for us is Browserify. Browserify is, is in a similar vein to Webpack, but it was the first to really uh, to, to do this. Browserify said, you write your normal Node.js module code, and I'll make it work in a browser. It does that by, because of the way JavaScript works, it does that quite cleverly by simply taking your file, wrapping it in a function, making sure that it defines what require module and exports is, 
concatenates all of those files together, wires up all the dependencies, and then with a little runtime shim, basically boots that up and executes your code. Your code is none the wiser whether it's running on a browser or on a file system once it stubs out the APIs. Browserify proved that for the browser, you could change the human interface of a language that we were using day to day without actually having to wait for JavaScript to change. I mean, if we were waiting for a new version of JavaScript, we'd still be waiting. Um, it's still not solidified. So what about CSS? Now, we've been talking a bit about CSS. The last two talks have been about CSS. And we have been changing this, uh, the human interface. CSS as a language has had virtually no change in a long time. But SAS is incredibly popular. There was a recent uh, survey of front-end professionals who I think it was 64% of people used SAS in their projects. Less was more popular earlier and is dying in popularity now. Post-CSS is kind of um, is rising in popularity because people can plug and, plug and choose the things they want. But none of them actually change what CSS is. They're just different ways of generating the same sort of code. That's where I think CSS modules is different. CSS modules uh, wraps a file format called interoperable CSS, which we finally sort of settled on in, in the end of June this year. ICSS is trying to be as small a change to the CSS language as possible to facilitate a module system. So we add two inert, uh, sorry, two uh, pseudo selectors import and export. They can pass through SAS, they can pass through post-CSS, they can go to the browser if you, if you want. Um, nothing will choke on them. They're valid CSS. They just don't um, mean anything until you give it this ecosystem around it using Webpack or something else. The rest of the file is normal global CSS. We didn't change anything. There's no runtime dependencies. It's just CSS. You can uh, concatenate it. You can gzip it. You can put it on a CDN. You can do whatever you want with it. And the way CSS modules uses this intermediate format is that when it sees a class like normal, it compiles it. It adds an export line as well as uh, rewriting that class. So now normal doesn't exist, except in the metadata, the export. The styles don't change. The selectors don't change. It's just the keys change. Then, as Mark showed, you import that across the boundary from CSS into your JavaScript component, and you get that mapping. So then if you change your markup to, to, to feed that class in, you line up with the now compiled output. And I want to sort of um, talk about this in a little bit with another example. If you have normal in two classes now, in two sort of uh, CSS files, they can't clash anymore. They get compiled to different hashes or to different uh, longer class names, whatever you want them to be. And they get exported into two different places. The only way to see what's in menu is to import it. The only way to see what's in button is to import it. And that lack of um, globalness, the, the lack of predictability about the output CSS means that you have to be explicit about where that code goes. So for a dumb example, let's pretend our button CSS had to know what was in menu CSS. There's no way for me to write it as an author and guarantee I'm going to figure out what's on the right-hand side. But I can import it. I can import that file. I can give it my own alias, and I say, whatever you call normal, I call menus normal. And then I could use it. Now, don't do this. We don't expose this in CSS modules, but this is the underlying mechanism underneath composition and a bunch of other techniques. This idea that the only way for information to move between files is if you're explicit about it. When that gets compiled, everything gets linked up so that your override class has the same class in that other file. And because we knew that you had a dependency from this file to the other, we know which order to concatenate them in. So now you don't have this source order unpredictability that you might have by trying to concatenate a whole lot of potentially um, global CSS. So I want to think about ICSS as being the browserify output. It's the translation of the human interface into what browsers can understand. So ICSS is a compile target. It's not a human interface. CSS modules uses it. If you wanted to design your own module, modular CSS framework, you could target it as well and use all the other tools that we've built for CSS modules. 
A file is completely isolated, it can port others, and what it really is is unlocking the power of Webpack, JSPM Browserify. It's a set of instructions, a set of metadata to tell Webpack what part of this file is CSS and what's JavaScript and how these things flow around. So CSS Modules, with the, with the best logo in the world, uh, takes this, and the first thing it can do is, as Mark already hinted at, is be flexible with what you output. You don't have to have normal F3.4. You can have, in development mode, a longer path. Now, there's nothing preventing us implementing uh, uh, source maps, but we haven't needed it. This, in development mode, seems to be enough. You could go further. You could put a line number of the first in. You, know, you could go however you like. In fact, we saw this morning about selectors, class selectors using uh, characters you wouldn't normally type. What's cool here is that all three of these, the middle doesn't change. You never interact with it in a different way. It's just a compile output. Why would you care? Your component needs the normal class, so you, know, you don't mind what the output is. Mark hinted at it. They use a minified version, uh, a short hexadecimal string. That works great. It saves some bytes. but it's not as good as you could do. The best you can do, as far as I'm concerned, is minify to emoji. Emoji is the best byte-for-byte -byte replacement of a perfectly understandable, uh, computer-accessible term, but also uh, human-recognizable. And if you don't believe me, I encourage you to have a look at my uh, website, glennmadden.com. <laughs> Every selector in that site is an emoji. So this uh, time tag has a chicken bone uh, class attached to it, the firework up, the firework down, lantern, love letter, engagement ring, blah, 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 blah all the way to the last one, which is fast poop, I think it is. Um, and what's interesting about this, because apart from being a minification and a joke, uh, it's also actually easier to read than minified code normally is. Because if you look on the right-hand side, you can start to see duplicates of Selectors. You can see the same class applying in three places, which you would never be able to do if it's just random hexadecimal strings. So I actually think minifying to emoji is not just a joke. Uh, I found it uh, quite useful, um, yeah, in real life. And so this is sort of a twofold approach. The first is by defining a, a file format that unlocks Webpack, Browserify, giving a machine format that we're happy with, we can do better. To, uh, we can better target. A, uh, a file format a module system, an ecosystem for humans. We're hopeful that in the future, maybe seven years from now, if you see BEM style code with their long class names that imply that this has to live in a global namespace, and if I get this wrong, things will go badly, that that looks as redundant and uh, unsafe as you know, JavaScript before a module system, and that this becomes the norm. You have contextual styles, not contextual just because they're local to that component, but because the tool enforces it. The tool says that you cannot possibly find out what large uh, becomes unless you make an explicit link across your project. And that, I think, is a big, that's a big win. Which takes me to part two. Part two is now, given the, the increased capability, given, the, uh, given a module system, what might we use it for? What, like, what use is all this unless we can write applications better? Node and NPM wouldn't have taken off unless you could write, uh, algor uh, write programs more scalably and more maintainably using modules rather than globals. So what does it look like for CSS? So I want to talk about a little example, which is that you have to build two variants of a single button. You have a submit button, delete button, submit button's blue, delete button's red. In BEM, you would have your common styles in a submit button class, uh, your blue colors in submit button normal, red in submit button danger. Should be pretty common to anybody who's seen BEM before. Then you apply both classes, the button and the normal, and the button and the danger, and you get your two outputs. The problem happens, and this is a problem that I've encountered that started me on a bit of a journey into digging into CSS tooling. Um, when you forget one of those classes. Because there's nothing to enforce the fact that normal is also a button. And if you do this, you break your styles. And if you're the person who built the style sheet, and then somebody comes along and writes a component, and they forget it, then you might get angry. right? That you've, they've broken this convention. And 
I would like to implore you to get less angry than you otherwise uh, would. Because something I'm recognizing more and more is that if you're designing something for other people to use, then if people keep making the same mistakes, then you haven't finished designing. You can get better. You can make tools that enforce these things. And so when somebody makes the mistake, I want you to take it as a challenge to make your tool better. There's plenty of stuff in CSS modules where, that people get tripped up on, and we're trying to fix it. So that's my rant. That was my little rant. Um, that's a, a, a topic very dear to me, which is code for people who are new to coding uh, whenever you can. So anyway, back to this problem. You have this button, and you've got the wrong styles on it, and you think, oh, look, hang on, they're all buttons. So why don't we just make the thing, the tag, button? And I think anybody who's done any amount of CSS should feel queasy at that. Because a button, using a button in a HTML document is not a styling choice. That's an accessibility and functional choice. So attaching lots of style to that information means that every time you use a button and it doesn't have to look like the others, you have to do a lot of overriding. And overriding is bad. So SAS comes along. SAS has a function called extend, which we had a question on just before. Extend does exactly this. Extend says, hey, if you use normal, I know that you also meant the base class. So submit button normal, extend submit button. Danger, extend submit button. That works great. It's exactly what we want. We can use one name in our output, and we can either get neither uh, style or both. It works by rewriting the CSS, by injecting so that submit button normal matches the top line and the, the fourth line, and danger matches the top and the third to last. Works great. Conceptually, it's beautiful. Implementation-wise, it's dangerous. I love it. I used it a lot. And then it bit me like it bites everyone. Bites everyone. Here's a quick example of how it gets bad. You can have, if you extend something that's used in multiple places, then your selector gets used in multiple places. If you have complicated selectors yourself and you extend something, then it gets even worse. It bloats, it bloats. And the, I guess the worst case is uh, Ryanair, uh, the airline that nobody particularly likes, uh, just released a responsive redesign that takes something like 30 seconds to render on an iPhone 5, something like that, even on 4G. Uh, even on a MacBook Pro, I think it pegs the CPU just passing the, C uh, the CSS for one and a half seconds. And nothing is accessible in that one and a half seconds. It's just simply trying to understand this mess. What I like about this example, one, it's Ryanair, and I don't particularly like them. The other is that all of this code is to reset a border radius to zero, <laughs> which means somewhere else, border radius is being set for everything to something else. Um, this is why extend gets a bad rap. This is clearly using extend, and it, it has this runaway output. This is terrifying. So you get blog posts that are written like this, what nobody told you, why you should avoid. Extend in SAS without creating a mess. Well, my favorite, which is SAS doesn't create bad code, bad coders do. Just on the topic of coding for newcomers, Writing titles like this, now the rest of the article is a lot more nuanced and a lot more clever, um, but titles like this have the potential to harm people who are new to code, who are potentially making the mistake that extend leaves there for them. And if they suddenly see a headline saying that there are bad coders, then maybe that contributes to a general hostility that doesn't need to be there. So again, CSS modules. How does it work? Well, it's a one-to-one -one replacement for extend in this simple case. So normal, composer space, danger, composer space. Again, we don't have to use submit button because that's implied by the file. Um, extend and, and composers are identical in this example. We also have the benefit of still using just one name, right? normal and danger. As we saw before, it doesn't really matter what the output is. We always just use that one name. And I can't harp on about that enough because being able to, having confidence in your markup when you're typing the line for your markup that you only have to write one thing is, is very uh, comforting. So I'll go through how this works. CSS module sees these three lines. The first thing it does is it rewrites all those classes, because the classes need to be safe for global consumption, depending on whatever rules you're using, it generates these classes. It exports those classes so that your JavaScript, the rest of your application, can deal with it and inject it. Composers, instead of changing the CSS in any way, just moves the export. 
So now, normal, when you use normal, you get two classes, as Mark already demonstrated. And that severely reduces the number of places that you can use composers. You can't use it in a pseudo selector, you can't use it in a nested selector. It has to be that simple relationship that this thing is something else, which is all of the edge cases of extends just disappear. So when you use it, styles.danger, one word, you get two classes out. And that, breaking the one-to-one -one mapping, is a big deal. It means that you can change, it means you have total flexibility of the number of classes, the type of classes, what the classes are, how big they are when you compose them, whether they have one line of CSS or 100. That it ends up being a big deal in, how you change, uh, in changing how you uh, style. So the simple cases here where the blue and the light blue background we want to use from somewhere else. We have a colors file, we have a blue class, we have a light blue background class. And now our normal button is a base button, but it's also a blue, light blue background from colors. And this is where the input syntax comes in so that ICSN underneath is wiring up the dependencies, building a dependency graph, which Webpack and others are, are very happy to consume. That gets compiled. The, the colors file gets compiled, the buttons file gets compiled, and then they just get concatenated because it's just normal CSS. Your button, when you use normal now, generates four classes. And what's good about this example is that normal now no longer has any rules. It's simply a uh, culmination of other rules elsewhere. And in fact, you put this through a minifier, and that normal line will just disappear which means you built a novel piece of UI, something that somebody asked you to build without adding a line of CSS. The more times you can do that in your job, the happier you will be from experience. The more CSS, every line of CSS you write is, should earn its place. And this tends you to this sort of structure. Now, people already do this with SAS, and they do it fine. They do. Um, uh, a shared directory full of things like colors, typography, layout, borders, dividers, sizes, animations, effects, whatever. And then a components directory, probably alongside their JavaScript, images, tests, whatever it is. And that division is very beneficial. It tends you towards this idea of using single purpose files using full of single purpose classes. That's how I code at the moment. To give another example a bit more scary, Let's say an article needs to be a vertical flex box, and a masthead needs to be 48 point, bold, serif, centered, with margin and padding. We can pull those, all those things from other places. So layout, the, word, the class centered inside layout means something different from centered in typography, which shouldn't be confusing, because those do have meaning in those files. You have context as well as names. And the output, you get three classes for the article and seven classes for the div. But you don't see that. You just use the name. And that breaking of what you get, what you're generating from what you're putting in, uh, it increases your confidence with what you're building. What it's doing is defining an API into your styles. You have the same, le same choices that you have designing other parts of your application uh, in your CSS file. So what, are, what is modular style then? Because I mean, we talked about it, it's less than six months since that first conversation, uh, about five months since the whole idea of interoperable CSS. CSS modules has, an, has had a name for, yeah, less than six months. We don't, we're at the, right at the beginning of this stuff. So we don't really know where this is going. But the one thing I'm pretty confident on is that the module system that we built should be capable of supporting whatever the next big um, CSS technique is, whether it's CSS modules or something else. Because going from having one global context to having lots of individual contexts does change what you're capable of. For CSS modules, I think the key is flexibility. There's one thing that I want to uh, uh, talk about a little bit, even though I'm running out of time, which is this idea of atomic design. Atomic design is a great metaphor for discussing different elements at different levels of resolution across an entire team between designers, developers, everybody. It's an excellent metaphor. If you haven't tried using it in your projects, you should. But as an implementer like myself, I see all of those things, and I just see a component. And once you start working with React, once you start moving to components, you realize that the level at which or the size of which a component is doesn't change how you build it, but it changes how you talk about it, 
how many times it's used, what parameters it takes. And I think if modular UI is capable through components, as I feel like it is, then modular styling comes through composing classes. Being able to, no matter what the metaphor, whatever, whatever style of, of code that you're writing, knowing that you always have that one technique, which is that each file has local scope and that you can compose classes from other places. As we talked about it, one of the questions just before is this idea of reusable components. So it's an area of intense discussion about what does this mean for the next bootstrap? How am I going to publish something that I can consume the bits that I need and leave all the bits that I don't? It's still an open question. We'd love you to contribute to the discussion. But in the same way that NPM took a little while after JS had this module system, it's going to take us a little while to figure out the best ways to do this. And the other big thing for us is non-JavaScript ecosystems. Mark already hinted at it. It's a personal thing of mine, which is that all of, the th all of the things I've been talking about as making CSS easier for humans at the moment depends on JavaScript being involved at some point, whether it's generating a static site or actually running your application. And it doesn't need to be. It can be completely offline. The same way that SAS can be used everywhere, I think CSS modules should be able to be used everywhere. Uh, we have a team of people who are building stuff. Uh, it's not just me. The project has a lot of momentum behind it, has a lot of issues, a lot of people contributing, discussions, patches. Uh, please, if you are interested, please get involved. And we're right at the beginning of this, as I said. Uh, my slides are up here. CSS Modules is there. If you like an, another introductory to the concept, I wrote a blog about it. Uh, that's me on Twitter. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Hey. Um, let's say you have a, like a layout CSS file with like all the different layout techniques that you could possibly imagine, and you only use maybe half of them in your actual application. Uh, will the CSS modules actually strip out the rest of it, or will they remain in there when they're compiled, or, or what? At the moment, they'll remain in. But one of the benefits of actually encoding your dependencies and having uh, written down that this thing needs this thing means that we can properly crawl the dependency graph and remove things that aren't needed. One of the things I think that I've found uh, as I've moved towards sharing more CSS, putting more CSS into fundamental building blocks, is the, the size of my output CSS is a lot smaller. That when you have 100 components, but they share most of their code, it doesn't seem to bloat at the same speed as if you start with a fresh file and you include a whole lot of things. And so it's been less, we've had less pressure to do that, but certainly we have the function, the capability to do that in the future. About like, okay, so you're talking about like having like hundreds and hundreds of components, say you've got like quite a big web app and there's, mm. there's you know, hundreds of components in there. Um, just thinking about like how you direct dive them, like with the directives and stuff like that, would you put components into direct, into like specific folders or would you put them all in, in one area? Like it's one thing we've been trying to think about actually where we are is just like how yeah. we, how we can go about creating directories with things that are easy to read and funnel through without having them all in one area? Yeah. Like, have you thought about that at some point? Uh, I've thought about it, and I don't have a good answer. I think um, the divisions of your components is an art. Right? It's, it's um, the same way as dividing your, your, your styles into your fundamental blocks is an art. And it, um, I've found I've had that same progression using Angular, not React. Um, potentially, React makes it a little bit easier. But with Angular, I've found that when you have 30 components, you're fine, but then one component needs five variants, and you don't want all those five variants to live in one file. And so tooling around that stuff um, is still, still coming out. It's still early days. But um, it works well for the first 30, and I, it feels like it should keep working as you get lots and lots of more variations. One of the things that I've seen, one of the approaches I've seen is encoding more things into um, arguments. So there is a kind of upper level component that, uh, the, whose sole responsibility is to dispatch to smaller components so that it gets all the inputs as a common interface for everything, but then the implementation are smaller and they would live in a subdirectory or something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it, everybody's mileage is varying at the moment. So.